Hello, and welcome back to Kvikminderpod, an Icelandic cinema podcast. I'm Rob Watts, and on this podcast, I discuss 21st century Icelandic film with my good friend Ellie Cawthorn. If you're new to the podcast, thanks for listening and exploring this most incredible of countries with us. This week, for the first time, however, we won't actually be in Iceland. This might come as quite a shock, but it's all okay. The film in question is Icelandic, but just so happens to take place in the mountain jungles of Nepal. Yep, week two sees us travel to Asia to join one of Iceland's most beloved singers and an Icelander raised in Nepal for a documentary looking at bipolar disorder. A favourite at documentary festivals in 2021, The Hero's Journey to the Third Pole is directed by Andri Snyer Magnusson and Annie Olafsdottir. The film is an artful exploration of mental illness as we watch Hugni and Anna discuss their own experiences in the lead up to a concert promoting mental health awareness. Before we begin, don't forget there's a whole two series already up and available wherever you get your podcasts, while series three will continue to drop for the next few Mondays. Please also join us on Instagram and Twitter, where we're at kvikmindapod, that's K-V-I-K-M-Y-N-D-A-P-O-D, and let us know your thoughts on the films discussed. We'd also be grateful if you'd click follow on your podcast platform of choice and give us a five-star rating on Spotify or Apple. And so... To Nepal. Hello, Ellie. Hello, Rob. How are you? I'm not so bad, thank you. How are you? Good, thank you. Happy to be back in the recording seat. I know, it's good. Second episode of the third series, Madness. No one can believe it's gone on this long. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I want to keep churning out films, we'll keep covering them. <laughs> um, and this week we are doing a film from 2021 again. Uh, this time it's a documentary. Uh, not a film I had heard of. No, nope, me neither. Or would even have thought about covering until friend of the pod, Alex from Nordic Watchlist, got in touch and said that we should absolutely check this film out. And so we did. To introduce the film, here's a little uh, message from Alex. Let's hear what he's got to say. Hi, Robin Ellie. Alex here at Nordic Watchlist. I am absolutely delighted to hear you're covering one of my favourite documentaries, The Hero's Journey to the Third Pole. I first saw this last year at Copenhagen Documentary Film Festival, and it really stuck with me. I think the subject matter is so important in our current times and having one of Iceland's biggest musicians, Hugni, involved really adds to the film. Also, it has to have one of the best documentary film posters going. Be sure to seek that out. So thanks, Alex, for that message. Uh, my first question to you, Ellie, is what were you expecting uh, this film to be based on the title and the poster? Have you seen that poster? <laughs> I have seen the poster. Well, I saw the poster after watching the film. And can I say, <laughs> interesting choice of poster. <laughs> I love this poster and it's amazing. But this poster to me, everybody should go and look it up, says 80s Spielberg adventure movie, which is really let's say, quite different to what we get here, isn't it? Yeah, the poster is essentially a Star Wars, original Star Wars type poster or Indiana Jones or something. And apparently it was obviously inspired by the artist who did those posters, Drew Struzan. But it's actually drawn by an Icelandic artist called Atli Sigursveinsson. But you're right, like... The poster is not quite the film that quite you expect. Similarly as well, the the title to me is pretty ambiguous. I guess we've got poles, bipolar... I'm really clutching at straws here. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's not the adventure story that you might expect. It's certainly... I mean, it's a documentary for a start, so there's no kind of Harrison Ford swinging from <laughs> branches and riding on horses and things like that. Although there are elephants and people yeah. riding elephants.
Yes, so the hero's journey to the third pole, colon, a bipolar musical documentary with elephants. I mean, there's a strap line, really, that you can't beat. <laughs> no, exactly. It's, and it's it's intriguing. Mm-hmm. And the poster certainly uh, draws you in. I mean, I don't, I didn't really know Hugni before this film. No. Nope. I know he's a massive musician in Iceland. Mm-hmm. And Anatara Edwards is not a name I was familiar with at all. But the poster just was like, okay, there's a guy with a guitar, there's a bunch of elephants, and it looks vaguely mystical. That's pretty cool. Let's see what we've got. And what we do get is a, is a really sort of artsy style, interesting documentary about mental health. Yeah. It's very much a personal story, I think, as mm. well. It's very um, it's very atmospheric, isn't it? Yeah. We're set in primarily in the pool here. So actually, it's quite different to the films that we've watched so far because we've gone quite a long way from Iceland. Well, exactly. Like so far on this pod, we've gone as far as Brazil in Let Me Fool. For a very brief sequence. Yeah, and this film is entirely set in Nepal uh, with glimpses of Iceland in the 70s. So kind of interesting that we've got this two Icelandic people on this journey and they're actually on the other side of the world. Do you have a synopsis for it? I don't know. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I was going to say the synopsis is, it's a tough thing to say because to me, Mm. it feels like the film was making itself up as it went along. As, mm. as a lot of the best documentaries do, they have a premise that the, the filmmakers go and they see what they get and then they compile it later on. And with this, it certainly felt like Anna and Hugni had just sort of, they'd agreed to me. And mm. then the documentary makers were just like, right then, mm. let's see what we can do in the weeks, essentially building up to this concert mm. um, that Anna had been organizing to raise awareness for mental health. So that's the that's the genesis of the whole thing, right? So Anna is half Icelandic, half British, brought up in Nepal. Yeah. She has had various experiences of um, bipolar, manic episodes, she calls them, doesn't mm-hmm. she? Wants to raise awareness of mental health issues in Iceland. So arranges for Hugni to come and do a concert, who also has had his own experiences mm-hmm. of mental health issues to come and do a concert in Nepal and it's essentially a kind of fly on the wall, but maybe that's giving the wrong impression of it, a kind of arty fly on the wall of their meeting, them sharing some of their experiences. And as you say, working towards this concert that he is... He's going to put on. Yeah, exactly. It's interesting, that the the artsy thing, because it comes up a few times where, and we'll, we'll get into this in a little bit, but the sort of the butting heads between the people telling the story and the people filming the story, mm. uh, whether what is more important, the message or the way the film looks. Mm. Um, but we should say that it's, this film is directed by Andre Snyder Magnusson and Annie Olafsdottir, who are both well-known and well-regarded in their fields. Andre is a writer. He won the Icelandic Literary Prize for his children's book, Blue Planet, which was the first children's book to win that prize uh, and he also once ran for president of iceland what he didn't win but he you know everyone seems to want to run for mayor or president <laughs> yeah. um but it's pretty cool and annie is a filmmaker in her own right most recently directed a video for uh marketa aglova i don't know if you've ever seen the film once yeah musical yeah. so the, the musician the female musician who's in that film her one of her videos okay. recently so we have these incredibly talented people who apparently were contacted at the last minute by Hugney to see if they wanted to come and document this meeting of minds and, oh. and see what happened. So they had a week to prep and get their stuff together and get out to Nepal. Oh, that's interesting because I was kind of wondering about how this project had come around, mm. essentially, whether it was... It clearly feels like it's the baby of Hugney and Anna... Yeah. That they've brought in some incredible filmmakers to present rather than maybe the other way around. Yeah, I know. That's exactly what it is. And I guess it's interesting because Anna says, oh, I don't like sharing my personal life, especially the the part of her life that she's kept hidden for so long mm. about her bipolar disorder. But at the same time, she wants to spread awareness. She's set up this concert and is trying to raise awareness and sort of an extension of that is to have people come in and document the setup and the meeting of her and Hugney who she just looked up in the phone book and called (laughs) so Icelandic 
<laughs> you just look up the most one of the most famous musicians in the country, look him up in the phone book, give him a call. Yeah. I mean, I guess the subject matter appealed to him. He he famously came out as being bipolar a, a, f- a few years ago. And, um, you know, it's obviously something. So it's a mental health is is it's still stigmatized around the world. And in countries like Iceland, it's still not well spoken about. People don't necessarily know how to deal with it, how to deal with people who've got mental health problems. And he's obviously a big advocate of getting people to mm. to know how to deal with it. And he is admirably frank on discussing that stuff, isn't he? In terms of yeah. he he reflects on his own manic episodes. Sometimes it's quite funny. Sometimes it's sad. Sometimes it's disturbing. But he clearly is in a place where he feels like he can open up and share those experiences in the hope that they help other people. If I have a human in Mark Aur, I will get a coffee if somebody get on one in Nepal. Times I don't know whether to get straight into the things I liked and the things I didn't like about the film. Just go for it. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> but I think one of my one of my issues with the film was that it had this kind of core aim, this core aim of talking about mental health and mm. destigmatizing mental health, which I think it did a good job of. And it was that to me was its strength in terms of listening to their experiences and them really giving like quite a evocative sense of what it was like to have a manic episode. Yeah. But there was so much else happening in this documentary as well <laughs> in terms of we were in Nepal, there was kind of a lot of incredible scenery going on, elephants, Anna's life story. There was so much surrounding that core message that I think it's got a bit swallowed by all of that. Yeah. I, what do you think? I, I see where you're coming from, 100%. I watched it a second time last night, knowing... It, I found doing this podcast that actually second views are quite useful with any kind of film. And last week, obviously, having watched Lamb a second time, mm. I completely... It was a completely different experience and I loved it. Um, and for me, this time this film on the second time round, I knew what the film was and it meant that all that extra stuff you talk about wasn't necessarily in the way and I could appreciate each bit for for what it was. But you're right, it's the mental health is the core, the mental, Mm. the, the talk about the mental illness is the core, but it is fascinating to see, yeah, you know, Anna's life story growing up in Nepal as an Icelander and seeing the elephants and a lot of what they talk about, especially Hogni, is to do with nature. So it's nice to have that imagery. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of the imagery and the way the film is put together actually reflects the bipolar disorder in a way. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's deliberate. You go from a shot, a very still shot of the mountains, the Himalayas on a calm sort of evening. And then the next minute you've got Hogni in the back of a van traveling on the most bumpy road trying to explain Mm. his first manic episode. And it just, the the contrast is just all over the place. But yeah, it was kind of reflective of what he was saying about his illness. Fyrir hvern er ég að skapa allt 
I totally, I totally agree with you there that when we have the stillness and the peace, it's incredibly still and peaceful and we can mm. hear the, the grass rustling and the crickets mm -hmm. chirping and everything. And I think it was very evocative in that sense of, yeah, like a reflection of mental state in the, in what we were seeing. I think for me, okay, maybe it's not the, that stuff that got in the way. I think maybe what got in the way was the guitar elements posing with guitars yes okay well it's interesting because i was know. much more invested in the mental health stuff than the mm -hmm. musical stuff well, even the, though i enjoyed the music <laughs> i guess i guess hookney is a musician yeah and i i guess that his music has helped him through mm. and to some degree documentaries like this need imagery yeah um and you could see i just I wanted it to be a podcast i'm joking <laughs> <laughs> the imagery, yeah, it was beautiful. It's but absolutely you, beautiful. But also what happened in this film is you see, see them trying to set up these shots. So he's there with his white suit looking incredibly sharp in the middle of like the dirtiest field ever with his white guitar and the three elephants and Anna are all dressed up. But then you see the the actual reality of it is that they haven't connected the mics or that you come out of that dreamy shot of the, them walking towards mm. the camera and you're actually like... We don't necessarily need those shots, no. but you, here you go. Here's here's what's actually happening. They're getting annoyed that they're having to do these shots, and they'd much rather talk about you know the point of the film. I yeah, I know that there's not really a fourth wall in documentaries, but let's just you know what I mean by uh -huh. that. What did you think about the points where it broke the fourth wall essentially? So we have, as you say the shots as we're kind of seeing them put together for the film. And then we have somebody saying cut or, oh, can we just take that again? And then we kind of, the perspective is shifted and we realize that what we're seeing is kind of a production off screen side of things. Did that throw you off or did you like it? Those were the bits that I enjoyed the most, I think, um, especially at the point at which they're traveling down the river. I, yes. I don't know what river that is, but it's massive. Um, they're traveling down the river and the director's like, if we could just sit in silence and get some nice shots of you with the sunset or what have you. And then they're telling their story. And then Hugney's like, I've had enough of this. And he walks off to the jungle. And that moment where he comes back and he's talking. Awkward. So awkward. But at the same time, it's, it's exactly what goes on behind the scenes of documentaries like this. And I think keeping that in really shows just how much it means to the participants mm. of the film that that what they're trying to say comes across but at the same time i was like yeah but don't forget you've asked them to come along and make a documentary mm. they do need other things you can't just it can't just be a film of you chatting at the camera for 90 minutes i mean this film's only 78 minutes which is a lovely length of film but you do need something to cover it you can't all just be talking and talking and talking mm. um especially if you make mistakes like with, with this podcast, for instance, like I can cut out bits because there's no video. We never make mistakes. Shh, okay, sorry, <laughs> I've revealed too much. Um, but when you're filming someone on camera, if they make a mistake and have to start again, you need something to paper over the cracks sometimes. And actually at the beginning of the film, there's one moment where Anna's talking. And I think it's only like two minutes into the film she's talking. And there's a subtle cut during her conversation. And I was like, oh, that's annoying. See, this is because you're somebody that works in telly. You can see <laughs> these things. Nobody else notices them. No, perhaps not. Uh, but I really liked that, especially that definitely that moment for after he walks off and comes mm. back, because it just shows like how much it means and how much the documentary makers want to make the film, well, want to make a film that stays true to to the idea of of Hogni and Anna. Mm -hmm. So to Alleleka, they have a room, a renna of Floti, some fairest of Floti Hemen, so if there is to give you the Cosola, Fatla Telter, and Fatla Gerum Sassim Atlama Gera, or Sassim Atlama Gera era, Vietlama, Pirta Sassa Sue, out film, or Sire Sagan, and an unu, or Sagan mean. First of all, Erwe, a scene free article. I think my, the bits I thought worked best was 
when Hugney and Anna were reflecting on past episodes and things. Yes. Uh, so Anna on her family history. With such great archival footage as well. Yeah, yeah. With the, as you say, archival footage and this kind of quite often vintage home movie feel uh-huh. um, footage, which you put in your notes, felt like grandma lo-fi. And I sure. completely agree. Um, it's that Super 8 footage. Mm. Obviously, it was what was available at the time, but it looks amazing. That to me is where it really, I think, comes into its own. And their first-hand accounts of how it feels to have the highs and lows of a manic episode Mm -hmm. was really interesting. And I think also they offered two slightly different perspectives on that. Yes. So Hugney, sometimes it's quite fun. You get the sense that he feels like in some ways he's been slightly blessed. There was a point where it's, it's, or maybe I've read something about this film that said part of it's about the the challenges and also the superpower that can be bipolar is in like mm. this idea that it can give you a connection to the natural world well, that that's you've never experienced. Certainly what Hugney says about mm. communicating with nature and then Anna says it about being able to talk to elephants and things like that. So you get a sense with Hugney and, and he's turned some of his episodes into quite um, entertaining anecdotes almost. Well, yes, and I think we should talk about a few of those in a minute because yes, they yeah. are fascinating and fun. But, but with I, Anna, it's much darker. Much darker. It's it's interesting because I made a note that a lot of Hugney's, a lot of what Hugney says is that when he's in his manic episodes, those real big highs, he loves it. Like the feeling is so intense and so powerful, and he's having an absolutely great time. But actually, ultimately, he knows that after that comes the downs, and the downs are not good at all i think as well the best example or representation of that is he talks about um going to the world cup and managing to blag a ticket into an iceland game and there's footage of him in Mm. the crowd isn't there kind of swinging a thing around his head punching at the camera (laughs) which is hilarious and if you just saw it out of context you'd be like this guy's great yeah but then so you on the one hand you're like this footage is so funny but then he says and then I knew I was like in a massive manic phase. And he's like, looking back on that, I can see mm-hmm. that I was completely on a different plane. And all his family were really worried about him. And his mum was like, you need to get back here right now. Mm-hmm. So you see like how it seemed hilarious and great fun. And then you see the actual reality underneath. Yeah. Which is that he was in a, not in a good place mentally well no and from a personal point of view i could never imagine being um, you know, really late for a plane holding the plane so i could get on the plane landing in another country just out of nowhere but like going to some random dude under a bridge and trying to find a ticket for a match and then like it's just it's the kind of thing that when you're amped up 100 percent you can do that but normally or well, certainly personally i couldn't imagine doing that and doesn't that follow the scene where he's at the Icelandic embassy in Germany. Yeah. Which is uh, <laughs> the, the good. I think what's great about these this story in particular is that there's footage of him doing yeah. the things during those periods. Episodes, yeah. And he's there singing in his. Uh, he does have a beautiful voice. It's a, it is an amazing voice. And he looks incredible as well with his long, flowing blonde hair and big bushy beard. The most Icelandic looking man. Oh, yeah, 100% the viking you know that anyone might draw if you ask them to but he's there drawing he's there singing the icelandic national anthem with a walking stick a banana in his hand a weird <laughs> hat and a and um his camera which he was still wearing at the football he can't explain why he's doing it mm. um but if you saw that look that footage you'd be like whoa that's Something, amazing yeah. like he's the performance is incredible don't know why where he is what he's doing why are those people in the background not reacting but it's an amazing video and it put me in mind of there's a there's a there's an icelandic group called austathir who are who are just a, a relatively well-known icelandic music group but there's a video of them online singing in i think it's a it's either an airport or a train station or something and the acoustics in this room are so incredible that they're doing these harmonies and it sounds insane it's one of the best things i've ever seen musically and i'll put a link to it in the in the show notes but watching that which was all set up 
And then if I if if I was going down a YouTube rabbit hole, the next thing I clicked was Hogni doing that. I'd be like, whoa, that's amazing too. I wonder how he got to that stage. But the you know the truth is it's nothing like the previous video. It's that he was uh, having a manic episode. Yeah, and he's he's a lot more frank about the or explicit about the content of his episodes, right? As in like, I went and I did this thing. I went mm -hmm. and I did this thing about how he made friends with a homeless man and then decided to record a whole album with him, for example, as well as another one. Ugh. But Anna is much more vague about her experiences, which yeah. is which is completely fair enough because I understand that they're difficult. I think at one point she just describes it as absolutely hellish and she doesn't mm -hmm. really say any more than that. Yes, and for me, that was really frustrating yeah. because she really wants to get this message across, but... To some degree, you have to explain, mm. you know, what it's about and why it's such a burden. And until the very end, when she says a little bit more, uh, it was for me quite frustrating. It was I was glad that Hogney had had opened up so much, but the like you say, their their experiences are very different. A lot of what Anna went through was watching her mother go through yeah. her depression and her illness and then dying of a heart attack which can't have been an easy upbringing and then to what's the line she says she she ends up being diagnosed with something that her mum said she wouldn't wish on the worst person in the world i can't even imagine you know mm. having to think about that yeah i think it's interesting what you say about it being frustrating that she doesn't kind of go into more details because on the one hand Obviously, this is going to be like the worst experiences of her life. So it's completely yeah. understandable that she doesn't want to go back there, as it were. But on the other hand, as you say, it is the whole premise of the film is destigmatizing these experiences. Mm -hmm. So I know what you mean that you kind of think we need to have that frank conversation. Yeah. And but obviously, it's, it's up to the person how much they want to. A hundred percent. And you almost get, you, you get a little bit of it when they're sat around the fire and they've had a lovely day and Anna's mm -hmm. like, I could be here forever. And I think it must be Annie. She sort of is like, starts digging a little bit and she gets a little bit about Anna's mum and what she was like. And then eventually she just sort of cuts her off and says, I don't want to talk about this anymore. And instantly the camera's put aside and it's fine. But what I also thought was interesting is that both Hogni and Anna had specific instances that they did not want to talk about so Hogni turns to Anna when they're sitting in the back of one of those carts and it's just like so what happened in New Delhi and she's like yeah I don't want to talk about that and then he's also had a similar experience he says I don't want to talk about what happened in Boston and you know in a in any other kind of film you'd be desperate to know what happened in those countries and locations but here it's like, oh shit, that can't, whatever it was, can't have been good that they really, even Hogni doesn't want to talk about it. And you've already got a sense of what these episodes are like, that it's just a bit like, okay, yeah, it can't, it's not good, is it? Um, I found it interesting as well, just on bipolar specifically rather yeah. than mental health generally, in terms of the almost del delusions that they both 
mm-hmm. um, talked about experiencing and that sense of um, Hogney talks about one point, doesn't he, about um, knowing that everything in the world was the number three or shaped <laughs> yeah. by the number three yeah. and it was all about to be four and this sense of something going on beyond what the rest of us can feel and Anna talking about communicating with elephants and stuff. I didn't know that bipolar led to that. I thought it was much more a kind of, much more mood based mm. and didn't have a kind of alternate reality sense. So that was really interesting. Yeah. I guess it's probably different for every person, but. Well, that's that's true. It's the experience is clearly different because while Hogney's saying, you know, it was, it must have been a nightmare seeing the number three in everything. And it's one of those things we all, we all have it to some degree. You, you start noticing certain patterns in the world and it, it, they're always there. And for me, and this is not not the same in any way, but there are two songs. One is The Strokes, 1251. There was a period when I was at high school, every time I looked at the time, it was 1251. It, it couldn't possibly be every time I looked at the, at the time, but it happened so often. And then there's a Rufus Wainwright song called 1111. Yeah. Remember and every time, every time I looked at the time, was eleven eleven, and it's just weird. And I, I can't imagine that. You can't imagine having a life dictated by a number. I don't even know how that works. And one of my notes is like having not no experience of being in these episodes. How that feels, mm. like you say, from a distance, it it sounds kind of fun to yeah. a degree, but it can't be. Yeah, I guess. One of my one of my reservations about the film, and maybe this is unfair because what it's doing is really focused, right? And as you say, they had a week to set it up and it is it's basically just Anna and Hergney telling their stories. Mm-hmm. That's it. So it's super focused on them and their experiences. But I think if I'd have gone in if I was a filmmaker and she said and Anna came to me and said, I want to make a film about destigmatizing mental health in Nepal. I would have wanted to tell a slightly bigger story in terms of firstly, it would have been really interesting to hear from um, somebody who knew them outside, like, uh, an outsider's view of those experiences. So for example, maybe their relatives or mm-hmm. you know, Hugney's girlfriend or whatever, who could say, this is the impact that it's had on me rather than just when, when he's in it, this is how it is for him. Yeah, An outsider's perspective saying, oh, he was, communicating with nature but actually he didn't pay the rent and he you know went off grid and then disappeared for five days yes the the truth from the the home side of things yeah Yeah. would have been really interesting again maybe that's not the place of this documentary but actually the one thing that i thought maybe was a error of omission Hmm. was that so anna's whole campaign is about destigmatizing mental health in nepal yeah but for me this didn't speak about mental health in Nepal at all. No. It was about two people's experiences of mental health. And then Nepal was there as a setting. But it really wasn't about mental health in Nepal. No, you're. it's hard to argue with that. It's true. Maybe that needs to be a whole other documentary, but... I think it would certainly be in a, a different documentary. I think that, that was hit home when, right towards the end of the documentary, we would get to their press conference mm-hmm. that they're doing for these concerts and then people are saying oh yeah this is an issue in nepal and i thought that's really interesting and something actually that would be something i see much less of in culture generally Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and i would have been really interested to know more about that yeah yeah you get those little sound bites from the various other talkers and the one in particular who's basically says we don't have any words for mental health disorders mm. in nepalese and that's kind of it but why what who where are those people who are suffering i mean if it's taken anna her entire life to get to the point to, to even think about talking about her disorder to then find someone in nepal who's got a mental illness and get them to talk about it it's probably even harder and if this was if this was put together last minute and it was about getting to the concerts I understand why they took the decision to go right well Hogni is this massive figure um and he's probably the most famous person that we can think that we can get and 
obviously in this situation was the only the person who was involved to talk about his disorder his bipolar let's focus on him and focus on that journey and when we get to the end see what happens and then we don't know they might have recorded a whole lot of other stuff once they got to Kathmandu or wherever I think it was Kathmandu wasn't it but that's not that wasn't the point of the story although I do understand we're in Nepal it would be nice to um to get a more local point of view yeah I think that's my main critique of the film that it it may be it's really hard really harsh I think to say I don't mean self-involved but it's very focused on the people that are making the film and maybe could have benefited from looking beyond. Yeah, fair. Hmm. And maybe Anna's whole other pro- project is doing that. So, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess the intended audience is anyone. But thinking more specifically, I imagine that the, first and foremost, the audience was the Icelandic audience. Yeah. Um, and so... This feels like it's made for an Icelandic audience, not a Nepalese audience. 100%, yes. And all the stories are... Well, most of the stories are set in Iceland or, you know, fo- most of them focus on Hogni. And it f- does feel a bit like Anna's story, while it supports what she's going through now, um, is more of a kind of... It's just kind of cool that they're in Nepal and not in, <laughs> in Iceland. But I did what I did like about it being in Nepal was seeing the similarities and differences yeah. between Iceland and Nepal. I think uh, Anna says she says it's um, it's a landlocked country, so you have to fly there to get there. Mm. Very different to Iceland. Iceland is a is an island. Again, you can I mean you could get a boat, but you're you're going to fly there, aren't you? Uh, which I thought was really interesting. There's no wildlife in in Iceland, really. There are foxes and there are birds, but there's not many of those. No tigers. No tigers, <laughs> no elephants, no tigers eating people, as Anna seemed to suggest at one point. Um, no monkeys, no rhinos. I really like the footage, the archival footage of the monkeys and then the current footage of the monkeys and then the archive footage of the rhinos and the current footage of the rhinos. I thought that was great. It's like, actually, this area of the world hasn't changed, for better or worse. Like, it's great that the nature is still thriving but like the 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 fact that in the cities that the discourse around mental health hasn't changed is obviously a negative but there's another point where so Anna's dad Mm. moves to Nepal after an amazing story for him as well he seems like um you know the adventurer in Paddington yes (laughs) yeah yeah he's like the the kind of archetypal stereotypal boys adventure book yeah 100 percent. like only could have happened in terms of dates like him going to Nepal in the 60s, was it? It's so. quite late for that kind of adventurer, mm. I think. Like, I was, I would have pictured him doing that in the 30s, mm. like Indiana Jones. But what I loved was that he, once he landed, like, tourism wasn't a thing there. And he brought tourism to Nepal. And actually, Iceland didn't make money from anything, from tourism, until much, much later it probably even i think we talked about it before like the the early noughties was really the boom in tourism in iceland i just thought it was fascinating to see how both countries have these mm. similarities and differences and yet are you know a million miles apart a certain wildness to them both as well i think yeah and that the land is as important the landscape is as important as the people really <laughs> Hello, <laughs> So we've talked about the stories and the episodes that Anna and Hogni have had, but they don't go into great detail about how they dealt with their illness. Yeah. But they do say some stuff. And for me, again, it was another kind of frustrating thing. It's like, especially Anna was like, oh, I really want to help people. But it's like, no one's telling me how you really helped 
you know mm. yourselves or how people helped you yeah. um anna says she has a great line towards the end where she's like she talks about her faith um and mm. buddhism and how that's helped her through um and she's she lists off a bunch of things that you know she hopes can and will help people who have bipolar or other disorders um she says friends faith therapy medication exercise diet sleep all of these things can you know help you overcome your illness but specifically those two it was quite hard to tell how it come to yeah how they'd got to the point that they're at now yeah i thought what was interesting as well there was a point where both of them said if i hadn't got help where would you be well they were asked if you hadn't got help yeah. where would you be and they both said i would be dead yeah which is really something to say you know like that's a strong statement yep and like you say i wanted a bit more nitty gritty about whether it was for example family members that helped them get treatment or whether they came to a point where they realized they need to help mm-hmm. how they were saved is the wrong word because it's still a process isn't it it never like cured from, no, <laughs> so, from something like this but um how they kind of reached a turning point and were able to yeah because anna i think we get to, we get sort of one sound bite from anna where she's like i used to think medication would be mm. the you know, if I if I took medication, it would mean I had a, something wrong with me, which I think is a very popular opinion and yeah. view from anyone who has to take medication for anything. It hits home then something something is wrong, but it's that's the thing that's going to help you. And I guess from her point of view, when she first took her first antidepressants and that sent her off the top end of the spectrum, yeah, like in a terrible manic episode the distrust of medication must be strong. So for her then to take medication to try and help herself was, a, I guess, a massive step. Um, and it's kind of only just glossed over. Mm. Um, but she has had 12 years without a manic episode, which is fantastic. And I guess it's taken that long for her to feel comfortable talking about it in any way. Whereas Hogni, I don't know if it's medication. Certainly he talks about having gone and checked himself into a psychiatric unit mm. um, after that really distressing story about, he says, I'll check myself in because he knew he was in a bad yeah. place, but I'll do it after I've done this gig mm. where he talks about his friend seeing their friend sort of fading away. Mm. And I can't imagine, you know, knowing someone and just watching them change for the worse like that. Must have been really difficult. Yeah. It is interesting how he can kind of reflect on himself in in those moments and say like, I was just becoming a megalomaniac. And you can just imagine him, you know, you can just imagine him being that guy at a festival that like traps you in the healing fields and tells you (laughs) how, you know, the world is actually made up of threes. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. But he's quite self-aware about that. I think that's the thing. It's like he talks about, you know, his ego takes over and he he starts serenading everyone. And, Mm. you know, he's being a performer. And the people who don't know him just see this really confident guy going around singing. But his mates are like, that's not him. Like, he shouldn't be in that position. And I guess I'm sure that it's not the case for everyone who has bipolar, that they can step back and be like Mm. that. Even in that situation, I know I knew it was wrong, but I couldn't help myself. That's all. I can't be a common thought process. But the fact that he he could and can and tells us about it is 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 fascinating. Mm. And it's not just the checking into a psychiatric unit. We don't know what they do there or how they helped him, but just that one step of knowing that you can go somewhere and can get help is is quite a big message in itself mm. for this film to be to be conveying. Yeah. Four of flakas on a middle board, or sing till Ungra Patna, or Alskana Fox, or Tha Fox and Fecti make if Anstan not Labara span anti Kurtingu.
En allir sem þekktu mig fjölskylda og vinur, ég man eftir ég sá mikið af minnum vinkonum og vinum bara með tárin í augunum. Að því þið sáu að vinur þeirra var að tínast. Hverfa. Og það var ekkert endilega vist að hann myndi koma aftur. So, Högni, a lot of his stories are to do with his music, and especially that serenading story. Like, he really combines, like, he wants to perform, he's a musician, but even as a musician, he and his friends can see that something's not right. But one of the other stories that he tells is so funny, and there, and even Anna's like, I shouldn't be laughing at this, but they both <laughs> are. Uh, the story of Hilur, the, uh, the homeless man who... Hugni offers a bed for the night. Mm. Um, who turns out he's a poet. Who would have thought it? Yeah, and so they he goes and records an album. <laughs> I mean, and what's great is that they clearly have this album somewhere. I mean, he says on reflection it just sounds insane, but love it. It sounds insane, but it sounds like also because he was there. Obviously, he was recording with his band Hjaltelin, who are very very big in Iceland. And they were recording some kind of soundtrack or something or score. And to just turn up in the middle of it, say, drop everything for this thing that we're actually working on. And I found this guy who's got some poetry. Let's record with him. Is madness. <laughs> I mean, especially, can you imagine being from the record company? I don't know yeah. if that's how it works. I'd be like, so what have you been doing the last like <laughs> month? Oh, we got this, this homeless guy who's been reading poetry. And... We've been, you know, doing some music to it and... I think he needs to release this album. You know what? The little snippet we get of Swimming Pool Man, I really like. Same. It kind of... Uh, lyrically, it didn't match up to what we were talking about or watching. But it, the, the feeling of that song was really quite... It worked really, really well within the context of the film. Mm. But the entire scenario is just, you know, so out of the ordinary. Yeah. You know, a person wouldn't just take someone off the street and record a whole bunch of poetry <laughs> surely but again there's something slightly joyful in it oh, very joyful and it, if nothing else it will have improved healer's life for that period of time mm. and it's not clear whether having been around hugney and, and the band whether that was what led to him getting psychiatric help but when they start talking about he did finally get on the meds and put on a whole load of weight. Um, mm. Was very funny, but actually, if it, if it was Hugney bringing him into this circle and helping him get help, mm. I mean... That would be great. Yeah, it's amazing. Sundlega verðurinn býður góðan daginn reglulega. Spyr mig hvernig ég hafið það. Samræðurnar eru enda sleftar. Music is such an integral thing in Iceland and it seems to reach into all these different areas. And here it's helped with mental illness and, you know, the whole point of this film is that we're leading up to this concert where Hogan is going to play and headline and raise awareness. And it's um, it's fantastic and it's a shame we didn't actually get to hear Hogan perform mm. at the concert. Well, I did wonder if that's where we were headed mm. and we were going to have a last half hour of the concert. But no, no, that was only for the people there in Kathmandu. I think that's fair. And also, I don't know how they would have recorded necessarily an entire concert based on... It looks like a crew of three, maybe, and a camera don't know how you do that but it was nice to see him performing throughout the, the yeah. film there's a nice what nice little bit of footage where he's got where he's at the keyboard in a town square or something and his voice mm. is just amazing yeah um, the music in the film generally was was lush it was and his voice like i said before is is just so strong it's so smooth and deep mm. and he composed the music for the film or most of it um he's obviously not just a singer he's a writer and a composer and that was beautiful and then the healer stuff is fantastic and then the film ends you know it's a it's a positive film the whole thing is positive and it does feel like the message of 
destigmatizing. It's hopeful, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. And this final song, it's the look on Hogney's face when they're, you know, it feels like they've rapped for the day or whatever. And one of the, and Anna is in the car and she's put on uh, mm. Bobby Morton's who, you know, I wasn't aware of this guy before, but he's one of the most prolific singer songwriters in Iceland. I think he's recorded like over 30 albums or something, you know, as a solo artist or part of a band. But the song that he puts, that she puts on <laughs> is just so lovely. Mm. It's one of the most kind of, jolly songs and the look on Hugley's face is like what you played <laughs> that and he just looks so pleased with it and Anna's singing along and I think it just goes to show that music can lift your spirits as well yeah definitely it's it's a really as you say it's a really hopeful positive note to end on yeah even if the song when which I realized the translated is called we cried oh okay yeah so it's thematically relevant too yeah but I'm going to be listening to more of Bobby Morton's <laughs> moving forward. And Hogni, of course. And Chaltaline. And also he mentions that he works with Goose Goose, who we haven't talked about since Under the Tree. I don't know if you remember, but when Atlee's in the tent under the tree and he puts his headphones oh, yeah. in, that's Goose Goose. I don't think it's a song that they did with Hogni, but, you know, everyone's related. Everyone's worked together. If he hadn't been listening to that song, he'd have heard the tree falling on him. But yeah. The Hero's Journey to the Third Pole. Fascinating. I think it's done the job of highlighting bipolar disorder mm -hmm. and raising awareness of, you know, mental health issues and that there are ways to deal with it and help. It may not be the most focused of documentaries, mm -hmm. uh, but it's certainly a good looking one. Yep. And worth a watch, I think. Yeah, I'd agree. So this was a film that I came to very recently, mm -hmm. as have you now. Mm -hmm. And I found out that the directors, Andre and Anna, have recently worked on another film, a 52 minute documentary called A Pause Ellipse, which was made during COVID, you know, during the, in Iceland, the initial 10 days um, that Iceland went into complete lockdown. You know, we started this podcast in a form of lockdown. We did. So it's really interesting that now we're getting films and documentaries about that time so this film a pause ellipse is a, it's a documentary of sorts mm. again but i wanted to give it a shout out because it's it's fascinating and it is a very very icelandic story we've gone from the hero's journey which is an icelandic story told in nepal maybe it should have been more about nepal but this one is a hundred percent you know 10 days shot during complete lockdown in iceland and we get to see the country in a whole new way. In some ways, it's super Icelandic, as you say. But in other ways, it's quite universal in terms of what I think a lot of people have been processing about lockdown and yeah. the last two years and what it's meant. Because it's really all just about, well, it's about two things really, isn't it? In terms of 
human connection and why this, why everybody being isolated and separated has been so significant. What it means to be separated from people you mm-hmm. love and and the world out there. And it's also about this this weird moment that we've all lived through, whether this is, you know, a harbinger, a harbinger of some greater doom, the, mm. the beginning of an apocalypse, essentially, yeah. or whether it's, you know, it's apocalypse or pause, as the title has melded them, whether it's a pause where we can reassess, really, and, and find a more positive future. So I think that's stuff that we're all thinking about. But there are some particularly Icelandic moments. Like, um, who was it? Somebody says, it's interesting how unified we've all been during this. I think it's because we trust those in charge so much. <laughs> Which, I mean, whatever end of the political spectrum you're on, I'm not sure that was the case in, in Britain. No, no, that re- is really interesting. And I think that, that comes from who's in charge as well. Like, I read that in Iceland, they didn't just go the government didn't make all the decisions. It was the people who knew the science, the epidemiologists and the head of the police and things like that. They were the ones making the decisions. And like I say, they all trusted in those people. And it turns out the country was only locked down for 10 days. They flattened the curve and life pretty much then went back to normal. But this film, we see that pause, those 10 days. The filmmakers somehow get hold of a camera and then just trawl Reykjavik in I mean it's not the busiest of countries or cities in the first place but seeing the whole place just completely empty it's quite alien and I mean it's it's a beautiful place to look to look at which I just thought was amazing and and those places that are usually full so you have the airport Mm -hmm. you have a have a dancer dancing on the runway in an airport she's dancing through the duty-free and the the baggage reclaim and things and it's it's a beautiful image that you wouldn't be able to see at any other point in probably in life. Like this kind of pause only happens, you know, once in a blue moon. And it, in this case, it was because of a horrible pandemic. But out of the awful can come something beautiful. And I think a lot of this documentary is that. Yeah. Like we, It's speaking to artists and directors and actors and photographers, but we get to see them doing something as well. The, the comparison that I really found with it was with Grace and Perry's Art Club. Have you watched any of that? I hadn't actually, no. The, and, the Channel 4. Yeah, so of course it was a Channel 4 series about in lockdown people turning to art as a means of expressing whatever emotion they were feeling in terms of from lockdown, whether it joyful or sad, you know, missing loved ones or whether it was... But it's also kind of quirky and irreverent mm-hmm. and about how art can offer a refuge in times of crisis. And that really reminded me of this. There are swift in winter in Lustin. Sprit do the Kaski. Bente Punter. Tilpunisham Hakliel. Möguleikar á umbreytingu minna af öllu þá verður allt stærra allt sem var svo heilagt er ekki lengur eins heilagt Of the 10 interviewees, they're all saying very different things. Some of them are, you know, appreciating the time to be alone. Some of them are hating being alone. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of them are using the time to create art. And some of them are sort of... Miss uh, wanting to misbehave. That that was my favourite line. I don't know. The film doesn't ask than anyone. It doesn't tell you who anyone is. Mm. Is the Um, assumption that if you're Icelandic, you would know who they are? I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, everyone in Iceland knows everyone, don't they? <laughs> Speaking for the country as a whole. <laughs> um, I don't know that that's the assumption, no. But I think it's interesting as a choice because they are all credited at the end. But they're they're just people. These are people living in, in Reykjavik or, or the, in Iceland in general throughout this period. But that guy, whoever he is, 
they cut to him so often and he's so funny. I think he's a good counterpoint, isn't he? Because we have people saying, this is the time to reassess our place in this planet and we need more social responsibility. And That's the philosopher. All, all stuff which is really valid and mm. really um, thoughtful. Yes. And then we cut to him saying, I just want to go and drink cheap beer. I want to break the rules now more than ever, which I think is a genuine sentiment that lots of people experienced in lockdown. But I'll get along with a gear. I'll be miss on one, but like, but I got, 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 but I you go from the philosopher guy talking about wanting, having attempted to kill himself, but then you have the the child of the the married couple playing the piano, <laughs> having written his COVID song. Yeah, where he's like, shit, 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 shit. shit, 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 shit. shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. It is fantastic. But the highlight for me from this documentary was a big surprise. I didn't know what to expect from it, and like you say, it's just a lot of artists talking about what it means and how we got here, what's going to come next, etc. But in the middle of it, you have a little bit of chat yeah. <laughs> from Iceland's premier actor, Woohoo! Ingvar Sigurdsson. Of course, of course he's in there. <laughs> you know, we can't talk about, we can't talk on this podcast about any film without referring to Ingvar Sigurdsson. <laughs> and in this film, we get to see him sitting in a tree house. Yeah. Sure. But that's not the most exciting bit, let's be honest. Not at all. I messaged you after watching uh, The Hero's Journey to say, you need to watch a pause lips, if only for Ingvar at the swimming pool. Which is one of the, it's kind of a comedy relief, isn't it? It in is, this. yeah. He does a fantastic kind of prancy, sachet, fabulous um, interpretive dance across <laughs> an empty women's changing room, which is all you could really hope for. It is, it, it's fantastic. He's... Yeah, he undresses, he plays around with the towel. <laughs> he then gets in the pool and he's like jumping over the... He's just breaking all the rules in the yeah. swimming pool, but in this kind of fun, dancey way. It's just, it's excellent. And how cool does he look? Very cool. With his blue glasses and his white shirt. He's so dapper. Anyone who can pull off like a trench coat and a kind of Baker Boy hat is, yeah. oh, is doing well. It's amazing. For that alone, it's worth it. And and actually, a pause ellipse is available for free online. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well, because you don't want to be missing out on that. So yeah, a pause ellipse, uh, a really interesting mm. document of of a very specific period of time, a period of time that we'll probably not go through again. Seems like God, Iceland won't. I hope not. Um, so fascinating to hear from everyone, hear their thoughts, and also see the country in a state of downtime so there we are two films by andrew snyder magnuson and annie olaf uh anna just fascinating stuff yeah and after the somewhat bizarre surrealism of lamb it was <laughs> nice to um get back down to earth with some documentaries brilliant well um i'll see you back here next week for something a little bit more mainstream See you then. Íslands du synda, Íslands du synda. Eit elivar smá, blómedig grandita. 
And there we have it, a double bill of documentaries by Annie Olafsdottir and Andrew Snyer Magnusson. What did you make of them? Perhaps you have your own personal experience of bipolar disorder and or being in Iceland during the COVID lockdown. Please share your thoughts with us. We'd love to hear them. And if you'd like to watch Ingvar dancing around a swimming pool, then the link to watch a pause ellipse is in the show notes. Now, as I said, next week we're going mainstream, with possibly the closest Iceland has come to producing a Hollywood film, in inverted commas. I'm talking about Reykjavik Rotterdam from 2008, which can currently be found to rent or buy in the UK on Apple TV. And there are some DVDs knocking around too. I once found mine in Poundland. Until next time, come say hi on the socials where we're at Kvikminderpod, and if you could leave us a rating and a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, that would really help others find out about us. And don't forget, we do now have a Ko-fi page. That's ko-fi.com slash kvikminderpod, where you can chuck us the cost of a coffee if you like what you hear. See you next week. Tack or bless. Thanks and goodbye. <laughs>